So here we have a word product. We had another product last section. Which product did we look at before? <laughs> well, at some point in pre-calculus class, we looked at cross product. Uh, no, vectors. last class. They had vectors. <laughs> Scalar products. So not to be confused with dot products. So we'll go write down scalar. So this should be, uh, recall, scalar. Product, I did alpha times a vector. If we're in three dimensions, we'll do a, b, c. And that was basically distribution. Alpha a, alpha b, alpha c. So that was scalar products from before. We're going to look at dot products now, which is completely different. So let's look at definition first. So we'll take two. So product is a binary operation, meaning there's two uh, inputs. We'll take the two vectors to be, we'll go with a u and v. And they'll be in n-dimensional space. So what that means is the vector u will be u1, u2, un, meaning there's n components, and v is really similar, v1, v2, vn. So the dot product of u and v, we read it as u dot v. I intentionally make my dot bigger than just a regular put your pen down once and make a dot. So if I just drop my pen one time, it would be a tiny little dot like that right there, I recommend you use a bigger dot. So the way we dot product, we add up the products of each term individually. So we can write it as u1v1 plus u2v2, et cetera, et cetera, plus unvn. And remember, each of these is a real number. So we're just adding up a bunch of real numbers. We get another number. And we can write it with summation notation. i equals 1 to n u i v i. So that is the dot product. So the dot product of two vectors is a number. So dot product's input is two vectors. And the output is one scalar. So it's a weird operation. Its output is a different type than its two inputs. So it's kind of strange. One way to think about it, it's almost, well, let's not think about it that way. But it's a little bit strange. You have two vectors, and then the pro this product is a number. So we'll do an example. It's pretty easy to compute with. So we'll do this in just, well, we'll do it in three dimensions. So u is negative 1 half, 0, 3, and v is going to be 4, negative 2, 1. And I want to know what is the dot product, u dot v. So go ahead and find that right now. The best way to think about it, you're just pairing up 
and multiplying the coordinates. Any questions on one as that product? All right. Let's do angle between two vectors next. Is there any reason why you would want to, say, take the magnitude of a dot product? Well, that's a good question. If <coughs> so, if I when you say magnitude, so if I wanted to find this right here, yeah. is this magnitude or absolute value? Magnitude. Oh, wait a minute. So that depends on what type of an object is in here. So is this a number or a vector? It's a number. It's a number. So if I write this down, I'm talking about the absolute value of the dot product. Generally, this is almost never going to be the two, uh, the two magnitudes multiplied together. Okay. I think that's only the case if they're parallel. And even then, I think you may, may need some other conditions for this to be true. Okay. Uh, so generally, they won't be equal. Let's look at some other properties first. Let's do v dot v with the same v that we had um, above. So do v dot itself. And you should get 4 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared, or 21. So the reason I did this particular one, this should feel very much like another operation. What operation would result in the exact same situation except a square root around it? Magnitude. So if we don't have a square root, that's just like the magnitude squared. So if you dot a vector with itself, you get magnitude squared. So in general, v dot v is equal to magnitude squared, magnitude of v squared. So we'll look at the algebraic properties now. So our vectors will be u, v, and w in n-dimensional space. And for this, I think we only need one scalar. So our first property, we call this commutative property. That sounds a little silly if you say the commutative property of dot. I think we normally say a commutative property of multiplication, but right now it's a very specific type. So we'll call this commutative property of dot product. And next. So 
So if this is a product, what property would you expect in this situation? What's the name of the property that should apply here if we actually have a product? Distributive property. So we should be able to distribute. And if I write 0.u, what 0 am I referring to? Zero vector. If I don't have the zero vector, I am doing a scalar product. So I want a, a dot product, so I mean the zero vector. If you have a vector filled up with zeros and you take a dot product, what do you think you will get? Zero. You get zero. So basically, if this is all filled with zeros, when you do all your individual products, you'll get zero. So this equals the number zero on the right side. You can move scalars through these products. And you can also factor scalars straight out of the products. So the products work well with the other scalar product that you've seen before. And just for completeness, I'll write the u dot u equals u squared. No, oh, magnitude u squared. Wow. You cannot square a vector. And I'm going to write one warning. So this is probably the most common algebraic mistake I see people make right here. If there's a different operation, what operation can I put in here instead of the dot to make this actually true? There's one operation. Plus. Plus. So if you're thinking about plus, for sure you can distribute. But this is not addition. So what you're actually looking at on the left side, if we apply the rules that I showed you, I'll bring one alpha out at a time. So I could write this as alpha u dot alpha v. So I'm basically bringing one of the alphas out. And now I'll bring the other alpha out. So it's alpha times alpha times u dot v, which of course we can write as alpha squared times u dot v. So you can absolutely factor an alpha out of a dot product, but each one of them comes out as a product. So just remember, the word product really means product. It does not mean sum. So it acts like more similar to a product than a sum. So you can factor an alpha out of this dot product, but you're really just rearranging terms. You're not really factoring it out. So any questions about the warning right there? Now we'll go to geometric properties. Start with the angle property. Cos theta equals u dot v over magnitude u magnitude v. And this angle theta will be the angle between two vectors. What type of vectors would really mess up this expression? Zero vectors. What happens if u or v is individually zero? What would we get? Zero. Undefined. Undefined. So it only makes sense if your vectors are not zero. They, neither of them can be zero. 
One way to write that at the exact same time, you could write when the product is not zero, but that requires you knowing the zero product property, meaning that if the product's not zero, then neither can be zero. Uh, alternatively, I could use a little more uh, writing and magnitude u not zero and ooh, not zero and magnitude v also not zero. So we can get the angle between them. And what angle, if they are perpendicular or orthogonal? So orthogonal, also known as perpendicular. So we should have a pretty uh, good idea of what that looks like. What angle would make them perpendicular? 90 degrees or pi over 2. What's cosine pi over 2? Zero. Zero. So that means if you have two vectors, neither of which are zero, and you know their dot product is zero, so cos pi over 2 is u dot v over magnitude u magnitude v. And if you know your angle is pi over 2, that means your dot product had to be 0. And the only way to make a fraction 0 is if the numerator equals 0. So we, we're going to say two vectors are orthogonal if their dot product is 0 and they're not individually 0. or zero, zero? It's a good question. Depends on which zero, which, so this, so let's look at this one. It would be the same type. What I have underlined better be the same type of thing. Okay, so it would be the zero vector. So, yeah, so dot product, so on the right side we're looking at a number, and so on the other side we have to be looking at a number. Unfortunately, we use equal signs to compare all types of things, whether they're vectors, numbers, artichokes, artichokes, <laughs> apples and oranges. <laughs> so I try when I compare equations, I use a triple equal sign. So that's one of the few times I compare things and don't use the equal sign. Uh, but the problem is, equal sign just compares two things, uh, saying that they're the same, but it doesn't really tell you what type of things you're looking at. You have to know a little more about what they are. All right, so we have orthogonal, and we have angle property. So those probably should make it on your cheat sheet, unless you have them memorized already. All right, next example. And all vectors orthogonal to the vector 1, 1, 0. So I've told you drawing, uh, actually trying to plot this vector in three dimensions is pretty useless. So let's just pretend that your pen or pencil is the vector. So take your pen or pencil and just s s sit it straight up on your desk. So it's pointing right at the ceiling. So let's think about what type of vectors will be perpendicular to this vector, your pencil or pen vector. So there'll be, first of all, a lot of vectors, not just one or two vectors. How would we describe every vector that is perpendicular or orthogonal? So it's every vector that live on the table or wherever your pen or pencil is sitting. So it's basically every vector that lives in an entire plane. So how in the world can we describe these vectors? So that's going to be a little bit tricky. So let's say if u is perpendicular, and let's make up some new notation. Upside down t means perpendicular. You've probably seen the parallel before. So 
So using the upside down T, I think. Hopefully that just means they're meeting uh, perpendicularly. All right, so if U is perpendicular to V, that means U dot V equals zero. And better not have, we already know V is not zero, it's written down. And you better not have a magnitude of zero. So I don't know very much about you. What dimension is you going to live in? Two. It better live in the same dimension that V lives in. So U has to be two dimensional, three dimensional, geez. You mess me up. All my mistakes are other people's faults. So the only thing I know about U is it has three coordinates, and they can't all be zero. I can take this vector and dot it with V. That's no problem. And remember, the product is commutative, so I could do U dot V or V dot U, get the exact same thing. So we said this was equal to zero. The dot product is A plus B. So if I solve for a, I can get a equals negative b. Does it matter what c is? No. So c is what we call free. So if we try to write down every single vector that's perpendicular, so c is free, so we'll let c equal t. And we also see that either A or B is free. So let's go with uh, B is free. So let B equal S. So we have an S and a T and then A. Last up, A is negative B, which is negative S. So if we write down all vectors, U was ABC, it'll now be negative S, regular S, and T. There's one restriction, S and T can't both be zero. So that's the only limitation. So you could write at the same time, I'll just write it where st is not zero, meaning that uh, s can't be zero or t can't be zero. That's the only way to get their product zero. And when we were talking about the, uh, thinking about your pen or pencil as your original vector v, we said there was a two dimensional plane basically. How many dimensions do we have? We have the same number of dimensions as free variables. So we got two free variables, two dimensions. There is one point or one vector we can't make, which is 0, 0, 0, and that corresponds to the whole cutout. Basically, you can't have the zero vector underneath. That wouldn't make sense. So there we go. That is all types of vectors you can have. We can list some out, like negative 1, 1, 0, negative 1, 1, anything you want. Whatever number you put in the first one, put negative in the second, and whatever you want in the third spot. Oh, we're almost in a cross products, this is good. So the last topic we're going to look at is work. We are going to do projections, but which do use dot products, but we're going to wait until we hit uh, lines and planes in space. So we'll do projections, which use dot products, but we'll do that in a future section. So what is the equation for work you remember? All right, there we go. Work equals F 
D, we'll use the capital D. Try to use reserve lowercase d for the derivative operator as opposed to other. Uh, so when I need to use d, I would generally use capital unless we're talking about the derivative operator. So there's work. Uh, this was in uh, assuming that your force and your direction were parallel. So for example, you're pushing something, something across flat ground and the, uh, your actual force that your push is exerting is exactly parallel with the ground. So that would be covered by this situation right here. Uh, most of the time, the force is not directly parallel with the direction of movement. And so that's what we're going to look at now. So when F is not parallel to direction. We use the dot product. So our work will be F dot D. And what this computation uh, basically does, it throws away any of the force that doesn't go with the direction of movement. So basically, you'll be only counting work that actually move the object towards its destination. You'll be throwing away all the extra work that was done doing other things. So then you can take the work that you get and subtract it by the force to get the work that was wasted? Yes, basically. So I guess if you're a business person, you could think of work kind of as the profit, but you got to take away your how much you wasted, which would have been your cost or something like that. The cost of moving something through all the friction that you go through and all that stuff. So our, our example, we won't do friction. Uh, that is complicated, I think. Uh, so we're going to have a box is pushed up a 30 degree ramp, 10 meters long, with constant force parallel to the ground. of 40 newtons. And find the work. So we'll start with drawing a picture, 30 degree ramp. So there's our 30 degree ramp, 10 meters long. So we'll put the box somewhere in the middle of the ramp. So we have, there's two forces. There's, well, there's really only one force that we're pushing. So the force that we're pushing, I'll call it F. Now, the displacement is this ramp right here. So let's write out the vectors. Let's start with the easy one, F. So how many dimensions are we in before we start writing vectors? Two. Two. I don't have to go to three. If I went to three, one of my dimension coordinates would always be constant. You'd probably want to set it always to zero, but it's basically a two-dimensional problem. So you don't need to bring in an extra dimension if you don't need it. So we'll just do this all in R2. Don't use a higher dimension than you need to. So our force, how much horizontal do we have? 40. How much vertical? Zero. So yes, the box is moving up. However, we're not pushing up. So what is moving the box up? 
I think it's called the normal force on the ramp, basically. So it's the ramp that's really moving the box up. Uh, what that means is we're wasting force. So we are wasting some force by pushing directly kind of into the, we're not pushing directly into the ramp, but if you think about two components of force, what color was force? Red. Red. Oh, perfect. So there's two components of force you can think of. There is the, if we project it, and we'll talk about projection soon, there's two components of this vector right here. And this component is basically wasted. So that part will not be counted in work. So what is displacement vector? What do I know about the displacement vector? Length and, angle. Length and angle. So what form should I use? Cos cosine 30 degrees, sine 30 So what do we call that cosine sine thingy? Displacement? Polar coordinates, or polar form. So writing the polar form. So we have magnitude of the displacement vector times cos theta sine theta. Good news is I know magnitude. 10 and we're using the regular 30 degrees because I measured the angle already the correct way so we don't have any weird measurements that need to be converted so ready just use 30 cos 30 is square root 3 over 2 sine 30 is 1 over 2 and just distribute quickly 5 squared root 3 comma 5. So if you're having trouble writing your vector down, there's a really good chance you're given the polar information. All right, take these two and dot them together now. That should be very easy. We get 200 square root 3 for the work. Any questions on that computation? So our next property, this is the end of dot products. There's not all that much going on with dot products. If you know the algebraic properties and geometric properties, computationally, very easy to do. It's just, do you know the properties? So we're going to go to cross product next, and that's 12.4. So right hand rule, first thing we're going to do is draw a right hand. And if you're left handed, this is way easier to do. If you're right handed, you have to use your imagination unless you can draw left handed. But you want to think of your right hand in this type of shape. We're going to try to draw it like this, but the best I can do is with my fingers more parallel. So we want to do this. So do your best to draw your right hand like this. And if you're not a visual person, 
I have a pretty easy way to draw this. Oh, it's a really big thumb. Good enough. I've done better. So those are your two fingers, whatever you call it, tucked under, and then your two index pointer finger and middle finger and thumb. So we're going to go U, V, and then this thumb will be U cross V. It's a pretty bad thumb. Oh, it's beautiful. Now, if you draw the stylized version, it looks like this. So there's a stylized version. All right, so the good way to think about the right hand rule is take your vectors u and v and put them so they are parallel with your table. Or you can just kind of put your fist on your table with u and v pointing in uh, horizontal, different horizontal axes, and then your thumb should point straight up. So that's a good way to think about it. So the order is very important. Let's go ahead and switch the order of our fingers, but make sure you don't flick people off. <laughs> As I do, yeah, don't do what I do. So how do you switch your fingers? I want to switch one and two. So I can't switch where they're pointing, but I'm just going to switch their names. So you have to think of where one and two are pointing, and then carefully rotate your entire arm, wrist, elbow, shoulder. You shouldn't be moving your hand. You should move the rest of your whatever you need to move in order to switch your two fingers. So what happens to your thumb when you make that move? It flips upside down. So your thumb becomes negative your thumb, meaning it points the opposite direction. So that's the first rule. U cross V is the opposite of V cross U. So this is called anti-commutativity. Commutative, however you spell that word. So if you switch the order, you have to make a negative. Uh, the cross product only exists in R3. So the definition we'll look at next. So just from this definition, Actually, well, I didn't even really say that. So a cross product is a vector. I should have written that earlier. Cross product is a vector. Whereas the dot product gave us a number. So the pro cross product gives us a vector. And that means on the 
this definition, the right side has to be a vector. We have a slight problem. What I underlined is a number. Magnitude is a number times magnitude. That's another number. Magnitude squared, or not squared, but each magnitude multiplied together. Sine, that's obviously a number. So it underlines a real number. That means that n can't be a number. n is a unit normal vector. So wherever u and v are, n is going to point directly up from the plane. Now if we talk about the plane spanned by u and v, if you took linear algebra, you know a little bit more about that. We'll look at planes in a slightly different way, in a more geometric way, and less algebraic. So the idea is that you have a plane, n is supposed to point directly up. We're going to take a different definition of this using uh, the magnitude of a uh, the determinant of a matrix. Uh, before we do that, though, let's solve for uh, sine theta. So what are you tempted to do to solve for sine theta? Move the end to the other side. Move the end. How, and what operation would we do to move the end? Divide. So what's what's the problem with just dividing by n? n is a vector. I, we can't even multiply vectors, never mind dividing vectors. So we can't divide n. However, I can divide by those two real numbers. So let's go ahead and do that. Once we have this, there's really only one property I know about n. I do know the direction it points. It points directly away from the planes spanned by u and v. But I also know it's a unit vector. What does that mean the magnitude is? So magnitude of n is 1. So we're going to do this equation. What if we take the magnitude? Remember, you're doing algebra as long as you treat both sides the same. So I'm going to take the magnitude of both sides. The property, the magnitude property we're going to use is alpha times v magnitude, so scalar products times magnitude. That is the scalar multiplied by the magnitude. The absolute value of the scalar multiplied by the magnitude. It's also true if you were multiplying by 1 over a, also known as dividing by a or alpha. You can do the same thing here. You'll have 1 over alpha absolute value times magnitude of v. It means whatever the appropriate operation is for what's inside. So if we look carefully, this one, what is a scalar? That's a scalar times a vector. Still a vector. Still a vector. So written right now, it's a magnitude of a vector. We can use the scalar properties to rewrite it as absolute value sine times uh, the magnitude of n, which will, be, which will be 1. We'll be erasing in a minute. Now on the right side, it's a little bit tricky. We're dividing by a scalar. So this is a vector divided by a scalar. So that means it's 1 over this scalar. So when you take 
the magnitude of the scalar, you get the absolute value of the scalar. Yes. Okay. Basically, absolute value and magnitude are basically the same operation. All right, so we said magnitude n is 1. So let's just sign. And on the right side, what is the absolute value of a number that's already positive? The just the number itself. So this is just uh, 1 over magnitude u, 1 over magnitude v. Keep writing absolute values. One over magnitude u. One over magnitude v. All right, almost there. We'll just rewrite this. We just saw it last section. It's uh, basically u dot v over magnitude u magnitude v. And it should be back a page in your notes. OK, looking at the left side, can you ever get a negative value out of here? Nope. So what that tells you, basically, this, if we use this, we'll never get a um, negative value out for sine. That's OK. This will measure. The only time you get a negative value out for sine is if you're counting angles in a negative way, because sine's positive from 0 to pi. So generally, uh, when you measure angles, you're going to keep them positive when you measure angles between two vectors. So we're going to erase this sign, oh, the absolute value there, and say that sine theta is always going to be positive the way that we measure uh, angles.